stop short of the terminal, you can have the Secretary General disembark there. A top diplomat on a secret mission flies into a mystery that will linger for decades. Going down! Going down, Grace! It's just not possible that Dag Hammarskjöld was killed in a common accident. It had to be something more. Victory leads to tragedy. Oh my God, please help us, please help us, oh God. When pilots gamble with the lives of celebrated football players. Total electrical failure. Oh. The physics of flying aren't gonna change just because someone important isn't back of the airport. A US Air Force jet carrying an American VIP crashes in a war-torn country. Was there some political issues that may have been involved was the airplane shot down. Three crashes, all with high-profile passengers. Can investigators withstand the scrutiny? That's what the investigators are facing. They know that they'll get the answers, but they need to be able to show the world the process that led them to those answers. A United Nations transport plane, the Albertina, is on a vital mission in Central Africa. Estimate of B Mandola at 2347. Arrival time 0020. The destination is Indola Airport in the British colony of northern Rhodesia. Controllers and local dignitaries anxiously await the arrival of one of the most important people in the world. On board the DC-6 is United Nations Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld. At least they're willing to talk. What else do we know about their latest demands? He's flying in from Congo to hold peace talks with a rebel leader. Hammarskjöld and most likely members of his entourage on board were pretty aware that this is a difficult mission. It was a secretary general for whom a physical risk was integral part of his job. The United Nations Security Council meeting again to deal with the difficult and dangerous Congo situation. It was Congo in the early 60s was uh, of utmost priority in the Cold War. It was of top tier strategic importance. A bloody civil war has erupted there. And world powers, including the US and the Soviet Union, are backing opposing factions. Hammarskjöld hopes to resolve the deadly conflict and help reunite Congo. All right. Descend into 6,000, mill traffic ahead. 6,000, yes, sir. The captain of the Albertina is 35-year-old Per Hallenquist. Our visibility should be pretty good once we get down there. 29-year-old Lars Litton is Hallenquist's first officer. All right, give me 2,000 RPM and 20 inches. Minimum descent altitude. That's 5,000 feet, but we'll have the runway in sight long before then. The flight left Congo's capital, Leopoldville, just over six hours ago. They made arrangements in the route of the plane to avoid any unpleasant surprises. We need to, to prevent an ambush, it's flown an indirect route, and a flight plan has not been filed. The pilots have maintained radio silence for most of the flight. Are you staying in Andola? They don't know who might be listening in. Negative. There were opportunities for uh, counter forces to uh, perhaps uh, shoot at aircraft that were on final approach. The Secretary General and his delegation should be on the ground in about 10 minutes. Your light's in sight. Overhead, Endola. Descending. Uh, Roger, report reaching 6,000 feet. Roger. OK, they're 10 minutes away. The plane needs to fly past Endola Airport and circle back to land on its only runway. At that point, the peace mission can begin. 
Moments later, controllers in Endola are becoming increasingly concerned. Albertina, Endola Tower, do you read? The Secretary General's plane is overdue. Lusaka, Endola Airport. Have you had any contact with the UN flight? Negative. No contact here. The plane carrying one of the most important people in the world is missing. At first light, a search plane heads out. On a slope nine miles from the airport, searchers notice a gash in the trees. The flight clearly ended with a violent impact and an intense fire. When local authorities arrive, they find bodies amidst badly scorched wreckage. Dag Hammarskjöld is dead. The Secretary General had been a, a very famous guy, a champion of world peace. So this was a major world event. I know that I'm speaking for all of my fellow Americans, expressing a deep sense of shock and loss in the untimely death of the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Dag Hammarskjöld. The Cold War politics surrounding the flight to Endola lead many to speculate that the Secretary General's plane was shot down. Was there anyone who wanted to see Hammarskjöld dead? Where do you want me to start and where to end? Rhodesian investigators search for clues. A difficult task because 80% of the fuselage is melted. Wristwatches damaged by the sudden impact reveal the exact time of the crash. 12.13. The Secretary General's plane hit the ground three minutes after its last radio transmission. Your light's in sight. Overhead and Dola descending. Critical questions about the flight's final moments cannot be answered by a voice or data recorder. The DC-6 was not equipped with either. The only chance of getting a first-hand account of what happened rests with a sole survivor, security officer Harold Julian. He blew up. <laughs> he states that the plane blew up before it crashed. And then there was the crash. He was not in good shape after the accident. It's hard to, uh, to measure the value of his statement. Investigators hope Julian can provide more details, but he dies five days after the accident. Did it really blow up for the crash, like he says? Investigators comb through the DC-6, looking for evidence that may reveal if it was ripped open by machine gun fire or a missile. And they test for the presence of explosives but come up empty. They divided the metal parts in small pieces and so on, and they didn't find anything in that way. What's more, when investigators study key pieces of wreckage from the DC-6, everything indicates that the plane was making a routine landing. Flap 30. Flap 30. The landing gear was down. The flaps were extended. Okay, speed down to 120 knots. Rhodesian investigators find no evidence of an attack or any other type of foul play. For now, the cause of the crash that killed Dag Hammarskjöld remains a mystery. Brace! Brace! According to the chart, it should have been 6,000 feet here. Investigators working on the crash of Dag Hammarskjöld's plane now study the navigational chart for Undola. It tells them that at the location where the Albertina crashed, it should have been at an altitude of 6,000 feet. 
he should have been nearly 1,700 feet above the treetops. Damage to the trees indicates the plane did not dive to the ground, but rather came in at a shallow angle. Investigators wonder, how did the Albertina end up so low? The transcript says, your lights in sight overhead, Nadola, descending. Roger. Report reaching 6,000. The transcript of the radio conversation between the pilots and the controller clearly shows that less than 10 minutes before hitting the ground, the crew had the airport in sight from a safe altitude. Your lights in sight. Overhead, Indola. But the transcript reveals something else. A single unexpected word. Descending. The Albertina was already descending when it flew past the airport. But it should have been maintaining its altitude. He's continuing to shed altitude here and keeps descending until he hits the hill here at an altitude of 4,290 feet. For some reason, the pilots began their descent too early. It's unfathomable that uh, there was any intention to be below 5,000 feet at that point in the, in the approach. These guys are experienced. It's tough to see how they could have screwed this up. Investigators can't explain what they've just discovered. Is it possible Dag Hammarskjöld died because the pilots were unaware of the elevation of the terrain below them. Your attention to detail, your altitude awareness, needs to be extremely high. I'll stop short of the terminal. You can have the Secretary General disembark there. The margins are very small. It's a matter of seconds before they hit the ground. The Rhodesian investigators have reached a conclusion that will be debated for decades. The pilots lost track of their altitude and flew the plane into the ground. Three other reports on the crash agree. There's no evidence of an assassination. The Hammarskjöld file is closed. It's a big thing when a Secretary General of the United Nations dies in an aeroplane crash. A very big thing. Forty years later, in 2011, the mystery is reignited when former U.S. intelligence officers make a stunning claim. Dag Hammarskjöld's death was no accident. On the night of the crash, one of those officers, Paul Abram, was working for the National Security Agency at a signal monitoring base in Crete. He claims to have heard a remarkable recording. The most important chatter came down to, we have the plane in sight. Yes, we've checked. It's the plane. I've hit it. There are planes. It's crashing. Dag Hammarskjöld was murdered. Period. He was shot down. The claims lead to a fresh look at the evidence. In 2013, Sven Hammerberg joins a new investigation looking for answers for the United Nations. My task was to look into the details uh, and see if there were any new information available. And I was asked to evaluate the investigations that had been performed before. When I look into the basic facts around the crash, I look at the trees and the crash site and um, the statements over radio and so on. OK. To reevaluate the previous investigations, Hammerberg studies the terrain around Ndola Airport. He notes the heights of the hills. He compares what he finds to what's shown on the chart used by the UN pilots and he makes a shocking discovery. There's a hill here, a hill here, a hill here, but there's nothing marked here. Here, where the crash site is. The terrain around the airport includes hills west of Andola that rise to more than 4,300 feet. 
but they're not on the chart. The crew might have been unaware of the height west of the field since there were, were no signs of it on the chart. Sven Hammerberg believes he knows what went wrong during the final three minutes of the flight. And it has nothing to do with assassins. Overhead and go left. Descending. Passing the airport, the pilots descend below the minimum safe altitude of 5,000 feet. 4,500. As they turn back towards the runway, they suddenly lose sight of the runway lights. I don't have the runway in sight. The pilots don't realize that a hill is blocking their view because the hill isn't marked on their chart. Before they even know they're in danger, it's too late to save themselves. I think that all the ingredients of a controlled flight into terrain, they are there. To finally put the issue to rest, investigators request NSA files and audio recordings from the night of the crash. The answer was that uh, they remain classified as top secret and will not be released. Given my knowledge of the recordings, tape logs, uh, facsimiles, etc., that they have concerning this incident. I'm not the least surprised that they haven't been released. Uh, it's just in their nature. It's been over 50 years since the mysterious crash. And in 2019, a UN report accuses several nations, including the United States, of withholding critical information. And without access to those records, Doubts about the cause of the crash remain. The common thing about VIP flights in general is they tend to be non-routine flights. And oftentimes the mission has a few nuances that make it sometimes more dangerous. And given that this was an airport where the crew had never flown in before, there are several risk factors involved here. So in a sense, this was a more unsafe flight than was necessary. But any lessons learned from the Albertina crash are forgotten when a charter flight is within sight of the runway and a football team's dream comes to a horrifying end. It's just before sunset in Santa Cruz, Bolivia. La Mia Flight 2933 is about to take off. On board is Brazil's underdog football team, Chapecoense. Colombia, here we come! The team is heading to Colombia to play in their first ever final in the prestigious Copa Sudamericana. We were always a really united team, a team that wanted the best for everyone. We were a family, and that made us strong. The team has hired a small Bolivian airline called La Mia to take it to Colombia. D1. Rotate. The plane departs Santa Cruz, Bolivia at 6.18 p.m. It's a 1,600-mile trip to Rio Negro, just outside Medellin, Colombia, the site of the championship game. Captain Miguel Quiroga and First Officer Fernando Goitia are veteran Bolivian pilots with more than 6,000 flight hours each. Gear up. Gear up. The crew is flying an Avro 146 regional jet. The 146 has always been a very, very sound airframe and a very good design. It's a little more expensive to operate because you've got four engines, but that's a lot of reliability. Just under four and a half hours later. Rio Negro 2933, good evening. As they are approaching Rio Negro, First Officer Goitia checks in with air traffic control. Lamia 2933 control, good evening. Radar contact, maintain and descend to flight level 230. Join the Rio Negro VOR. The controller instructs the crew to go into a holding pattern because other planes are in a queue waiting to land. They choose a holding point called Gemli. Holding at Gemli. 
Seven minutes later, a request from the Lamia cockpit takes air traffic control by surprise. Lamia 2933, request priority for approach. We have a fuel problem. Yes, for priority, you're basically making a request that if they can fit it in, get you in a little bit faster. And I have an aircraft below you on approach. Uh, additionally, they are doing a runway inspection. But within seconds, the situation in the cockpit suddenly appears more urgent. We have a fuel emergency. That's why I'm asking you at once for final approach, requesting immediate descent. Boys. It's very unusual to declare priority and then 30 seconds later say they're out of fuel. Let me make a right turn now. To begin your descent, you have traffic one mile below. When you declare an emergency, the Red Sea parts, now everybody is concentrating on doing exactly what you need, especially to get to the airfield as soon as possible. We're already starting to descend. And heading for the runway. In the cabin, the lights go out and the engines fall silent. The team feels the plane descending. Nobody said anything to us. We didn't know anything. 2933, total electrical failure, without fuel. Runway's cleared, firefighters alerted. Color, we need vectors. Vectors. Vectors to the runway. The crew needs the controller to provide directions to the runway, but the plane has disappeared from radar. Lost your radar signal. I don't have you. Report heading now. Heading 360. 360. When they told me their altitude was 9,000 feet, I thought the worst. My God, please help us, please help us, oh God. I remember asking God to make the lights and motors turn back on. Emergency crews rush to the crash site. They discover that seven passengers are still alive, including four Chapecoense players. You feel desperate. I was terrified. I didn't want to die. I didn't want any of us to die. But 70 people are dead. It's one of the worst tragedies in the history of sport. The morning light reveals that the Lamia plane hit the crest of an 8,700-foot mountain. A team from the Colombian Air Accident Investigation Group is already on scene. Landing gear was down. Investigators can see the plane was configured for landing. No. Flaps are extended. Esta dinámica del impacto como tal nos nos muestra pues la posición. The wreckage showed the plane's position in relation to the runway and the crew's intentions of heading there. Probablemente la tripulación de dirigirse hacia allá. It's clear that the crew was descending towards the airport. No scorch marks. But their biggest clue is what they don't find. No fuel smell either. There was a very light smell of fuel at the accident site. Normally, when planes crash with fuel on board, the smell is much stronger. The fuel level indicators are at zero. The plane was out of fuel. Investigators wonder, how did the fuel get to zero? Was it a mechanical failure or human error? As Brazilian fans grieve the loss of their beloved Chapecoense football team in the crash of Lamia Flight 2933, investigators hope the flight data recorder contains clues as to why the jet was completely out of fuel when it hit the ground. Let's isolate the fuel flow rate. If there was a leak or some other problem, it should show up here. Okay, let's go. They consider the possibility that a fuel leak led to an unexpected engine shutdown. They're consuming just over 1,000 pounds of fuel an hour throughout their cruise. Very steady. El consumo de combustible 
The fuel consumption, according to the data recorder, was normal for the duration of the flight. Fuel system checks out. Let's look at the warning system. If the fuel warning system malfunctioned, the pilots may not have been aware there was a problem. The warning goes on here at 9.15. Well, that can't be right. They don't declare a fuel emergency until 9.52. They knew they were low on fuel for nearly 40 minutes without declaring a fuel emergency. Investigators can't believe what they're seeing. At 9.15, a low fuel warning light turns on. That's got to be about uh, 180 miles to Medellin. They should have found somewhere closer to land. They are here. Bucata Airport is here. Uh, 77 miles away. Why didn't they land at Bucata? According to the manufacturer, when the low fuel warning comes on in this aircraft, you are only guaranteed 23 more minutes of flight. Las aeronaves tienen un remanente por fabricante. But the pilots flew 13 minutes beyond that limit. They should reroute the plane to Bogota, but instead they continue to Medellin. So you look at this and you say, oh my God, you violated the basic procedures. We know how to stay safe. We know how not to run out of gas in the air. And you guys didn't do a single thing in accordance with the rules. As Chape Coense's fans mourn their heroes, <clears throat> looks like we have a problem. Investigators turn to the plane's cockpit voice recorder for answers. But they discover it cut out one hour and 40 minutes before the end of the flight. It's a huge setback. Investigators still don't know why the plane ran out of fuel. Did the pilots make mistakes calculating their fuel load before the jet left Santa Cruz airport? So they take off with about 20,000 pounds of fuel. Should that do it? Taxi before takeoff, 441 pounds. Julian Echeverry and his team calculate how much fuel the plane legally needed to make a direct flight to Medellin. You have to have enough fuel to take off, fly to your destination, and land. You have to have enough fuel to go down and make an approach and come back up. And then you have to have enough fuel to fly to an alternate destination and to hold for 30 minutes and then to descend and land. Total, 26,570 pounds. So they were short by about 6,570 pounds. They left with enough to get to Medellin, but barely a drop more. Investigators then discover a disturbing pattern. Three times earlier in the year, this crew had made the same flight, but in the opposite direction, without any reserve fuel. Each time, they landed successfully. Less fuel is used because Rio Negro is higher in altitude. You ascend a shorter distance, therefore saving more fuel. No doubt that contributed to the flight arriving safely at Santa Cruz. Investigators now see that in addition to disregarding the need for reserve fuel, the crew didn't account for the additional 6,000-foot climb. They didn't just press the limits. They did something really criminal because they put the airplane right at the edge of its capability to burn fuel and get them back on the ground safely. Now investigators need to know why these pilots didn't follow the most basic protocols. The answer lies back in Bolivia. It emerges that Captain Quiroga was a Lamia co-owner with a financial stake in the company. Did he gamble dozens of lives just to save money on fuel? When you've got somebody who is flying the airplane and responsible for the airplane, who also is a part owner and knows the finances, you've got a conflict of interest. When investigators get their hands on company records... Looks like they owed everybody. Even the employees weren't getting paid. They discover the company was in big financial trouble. The captain likely skimped on fuel to save money. I think the crew knew they were doing something illegal. The crew knew they were below the appropriate fuel levels from the beginning of the flight. 
This is a sad and unfortunate part of the accident. La Mia's co-owner, Vargas Gamboa, is charged with manslaughter and the airline's operating license is suspended. La Mia is out of business by the end of the year. Surviving player Jackson Fulman is walking again with a prosthetic leg, but the pain and memories of that night endure. I want people to pray for us and remember all of those people that left us, those fighters who fought until the end. I'd like to see everyone honor the people who unfortunately left us that night. Those decisions to press the airplane beyond its limits and the unwillingness to advise air traffic control of the criticality of their fuel situation directly resulted in the accident. And it, it's one that I could not believe a professional pilot would do. But when pilots flying a high-level delegation make a bad decision, the top official on board never reaches his final destination. Heavy rain soaks a small airport in Dubrovnik, Croatia. Heading towards it is a US Air Force 737 carrying 35 people on a trade mission. Leading the delegation, US Secretary of Commerce Ron Brown, a star in the Democratic Party who helped Bill Clinton get elected. Ron Brown was a Washington insider, uh, and he had all the skills that, that go with that. The goal of his mission is to help Croatia and Bosnia rebuild their economies. A destructive war in that region has just ended in an uneasy truce. The pressures to get the passengers to scheduled news conferences and other activities were probably pretty high. Departure IFO 21. Ashley J. Davis is the captain. He's a military pilot who flew mid-air refuelers high above the Persian Gulf. Tonight, the bad weather is just one of the challenges the crew is facing. The airport was totally trashed by the Serbs who had taken over the airport during the 91 war. They destroyed the instrument landing system. The crew must rely on a signal from a navigational beacon to guide them to the airport. Age. At Kilo Lima Papa, we're tracking outbound at 119 degrees. 119 confirmed. Mr. Secretary, we're landing. We'll take this up later, Adam. It's not very broken up down there. I can't see through it. Tim? The clouds are thick. The crew can't see the ground. They have to trust their instruments as they descend through the storm. IFO 21, sir, we are inside the locator, inbound. IFO 21, Roger, cleared for beacon approach. For now, AJ Davis is flying blind, but he expects to see the airport soon. Do you read? Just before 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Dubrovnik Tower loses all contact with IFO 21. IFO 21, Dubrovnik approach. Do you read? IFO 21, do you read? With no radar to track the plane, controllers have no idea where it is. Four and a half hours later, it's confirmed that IFO-21 crashed into a nearby mountain range. 35 die as a result of the accident. The fatal flight of the US Air Force jet carrying Commerce Secretary Ron Brown becomes a high profile investigation. The Vice President and I wanted to come here to be with the employees of the Commerce Department at this very difficult hour. In every accident, there's always a lot of speculation. 
In this particular case, you had a high-ranking U.S. government official. Uh, so my idea was to get as much information, the physical evidence as I could. The investigation team is at a disadvantage. They discover that there is no cockpit voice recorder or flight data recorder on the plane. It's not required on Air Force jets. I had assumed that the Air Force and these VIP flights had higher safety standards than commercial flights. And so I was really shocked to learn that the standards were generally lower than those for commercial aviation. The crash site is just over two miles from the airport. Investigators wonder what happened during the flight's final moments. The team plots the plane's fatal descent using data from a surveillance plane that was patrolling the region. The radar track that I was given showed that the en route portions of the flight from about 100 miles prior to the airport were entirely nominal. But on its final approach, the plane begins to head off course and straight towards the mountains. My initial look at the flight track of the aircraft uh, showed a, a seven degree bearing error in the final segment of the approach. How could a military crew flying a very high profile government official end up seven degrees off course and headed towards elevated terrain? Investigators need to find out why U.S. Air Force jet IFO-21 veered off course just before it crashed. An important clue turns up in the wreckage. It's the plane's ADF, or Automatic Direction Finder. The device listens to signals put out by two navigational beacons. The first beacon transmits Morse code to the plane. When the crew hears the signal, they follow a heading specified on their landing chart. That should take them straight to the runway. But if the crew hears the second beacon before they see the runway, they must declare a missed approach and circle around to try landing again. To land in Dubrovnik safely, a plane needs two ADF receivers, one for each beacon. We're still not past it. I'm tuned back to KLP. But investigators discover this jet had only one receiver. And only having one ADF restricted their ability to follow the approach accurately. The crew would have to switch the ADF back and forth between the two signals, adding a complication to an already difficult landing. It's going to become rather difficult in trying to dial both to keep listening to the code if you're also trying to search for your course and heading. In fact, flight IFO-21's erratic flight path suggests to investigators that the flight crew gave up on the ADF navigation and used an even older piece of technology to find the runway, the INS, or Inertial Navigation System. An INS system uses gyroscopes to maintain an awareness of how much the airplane turns and banks. But the INS has a potential flaw. If the gyroscopes don't calculate each maneuver perfectly, a pilot can drift off course. It's not very broken up down here. I can't see through it. Tim? INS drift in this case was probably, in my view, the primary reason the aircraft ended up where it was. Investigator Howard Swansea recovers the Jeppesen approach chart. Hampered by poor visibility and relying on the INS, the chart would have been a key aid to the crew. On close inspection, Swansea notices something peculiar. A key figure, the minimum descent altitude, is wrong. Given the height of the surrounding mountains, they should have been flying at 2,800 feet. But the chart's minimum descent altitude is 700 feet lower than that. The chart made the pilots think they were still safely above the mountains as they searched for the airport.
Investigators now understand the circumstances that led to the crash that killed Commerce Secretary Ron Brown. In the end, a fatal combination of factors caused the accident. Dubrovnik approach, IFO 21, level 100. Dubrovnik approach, good afternoon. Maintain 10,000 feet for beacon approach. Runway 12. IFO 21. The crew were fighting bad weather. They were landing in an unfamiliar airport and hampered by old technology. In the final report, Dubrovnik Airport is singled out for an improperly designed approach procedure. I got CV. AJ Davis and his crew are found responsible for flight errors they made in their push to get their mission on the ground. In response, the Air Force also orders all military aircraft to carry flight data recorders and cockpit voice recorders. Yeah. And prohibits aircraft, including those for high-ranking diplomats, from flying into an airport without approval from the Department of Defense. In all three of these cases where you have VIPs on the airplane, um, there was complex environment and also the desire to get these important people where they need to be on time. And the crew put pressure on themselves to push the edges uh, of their capabilities to make sure that these people arrived on time. The basics for flying an airplane doesn't change based on who's on the airplane. Whether it's a VIP or a regular everyday passenger, the same risk have to be dealt with. The physics of flying aren't going to change just because someone important isn't back of the airplane. 